Hi, I'm Elaine. This is Elaine is XYZ, a vlog that's currently about whether or not here in China. Shizu, shizu. Bye, bye. Okay, again. These little furry friends are friends or food. Because apparently we still have to learn a bunch of you motherfuckers on this issue. So yes, eating dogs. A topic I don't particularly enjoy talking about, but I get exposed to a lot anyway. Both in my personal life, since some yokel will always ask me because I look like this if I've eaten dogs before, and now in my professional life as well. Since I work for an organization that showcases China, you tend to get a pretty um, typical assortment of comments anytime you feature anything that has to do with dogs. Like in the case of this cafe we featured where you get to hang out with huskies and in any other country that would be like, oh wow, so cute. And because it's in China, you get comments like this. It's annoying, but expected. And sometimes this topic comes completely out of left field. Like now, with this fantastically long, fantastically meandering feature published by The New Yorker late last month. Authored by Nick Palmgarten, a writer there for the last 20 years or so, the title of the piece is this innocuous seeming what will become of the pandemic pets? In times of stress and isolation, we turn to them for comfort. Now it's time to think about what owning animals really means. Ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo. For about half of its 6,000 words, it talks about exactly that. Going into the rise of vet visits during the pandemic, the trend of considering pets your babies, and even a bit of history as to why there are so few shelter pets available now in the USA. Uh, apparently the system has both been very, very decent at sterilization and before that, euthanization. Apparently 7 million dogs were euthanized in 1973. That's a lot of doggos. I don't hate on that part of the feature. It meanders a bit and contains the kind of typical navel gazy New Yorker feature writer bit of you know, this applies to me and my relationship with XYZ. But, but otherwise, it is setting good context for a good question. What is America going to do to all of its pets now that it's uh, no longer working from home? If only it was focused on that. Because that sensible story is sandwiched between a beginning and an end of something that has absolutely nothing to do with it, except, I suppose, that it involves dogs. Doge. The first 850 plus word starts with a character study of a 56 year old man who's aggressively angry about being quarantined in a hotel while waiting for permission to leave so that he can rescue dogs from the infamous Yulin Meat Festival and bring them back to the US to be adopted. It then paints his organization, No Dogs Left Behind, as some sort of guerrilla rebel with a cause operation, with his colleagues allegedly giving him nicknames like The General or, and this was actually written, Dog Rambo Jesus. The story is interrupted after a very suspect reminder that COVID came from Wuhan, and I'll get into that later, in order to insert the piece that's actually focused on Americans in America. We spend the next 25 paragraphs on American vets and American pets and American pet owners before suddenly pivoting back to the No Dogs Left Behind organization for the final nearly 3,000 words of the article. I know I'm shocked too. In those 3,000 words, we're introduced to other members of Dog Rambo Jesus' crusade and how they got into the rescuing dogs from China business. Their logistics director fell in love with stray dogs wandering the beaches of Puerto Rico. Their communications director was hired to do a hit on Dog Rambo Jesus by another dog rescuer, but then switch sides. There's also a lady lawyer, but we don't hear much about her backstory, just what she's been working on for the No Dogs Left Behind organization. But summarizing that whole bit, Dog Rescue Jesus got started in 2016, just five years ago, and now he's allegedly rescued tens of thousands of dogs directly or indirectly from a sad, disgusting fate. 
Thanks to it being a global pandemic, and China being one of the most stringent countries when it comes to quarantining, something I experienced very early on last year in March, dog rescue Jesus gets stuck for a while. America then bans dogs coming from anywhere abroad because of the rabies scare, and then suddenly the 95 dogs he managed to get pre-adopted can't get to the USA. So Palm Garden does try to provide some context on what's happening in China during these 3,000 words, but for the most part, we might as well be watching a Sopranos episode with Tony running around China, cursing at how horrifying they are to puppies. You motherfuckers, you mother... And at this point in time, you might be asking, so how many pets in America are actually dogs that have been rescued from the Yulin Meat Festival? Mm, here's a hint, it's incredibly negligible. So according to the ASPCA, America adopts 1.6 million dogs every year and another 670,000 are stuck in shelters and euthanized. Animals Asia, one of the prominent animal rights organizations covering this entire continent, estimated in 2017 that the Yulin Festival had already shrunk to around 1,000 dogs slaughtered altogether. While you can't put a price on the souls of 1,000 dogs, it does mean that even if NDLB was rescuing all of them, it would still be 670 times less dogs than if they'd concentrated on getting those guys off the euthanization list back in America. 670 times. But that's just the start of why this is all problematic. And before we truly deep dive into all of that, I am going to caveat that there aren't really any outright lies in this article. The worst and most obvious fact check would be conflating Yulin and Wuhan to be somewhere similar to begin with. As you see in this map here, they're actually 800 miles apart in different provinces, which is the Chinese equivalent to states. It'd be like if you were reporting on people rescuing animals in New Mexico and then conflated it with what folks were doing in Nebraska. But yes, the Yulin Meat Festival does exist and yes, China probably on a whole doesn't view the consumption of dogs with as much horror as uh, the regular American would. And yes, there are in fact quite a lot of foreign volunteers working in these dog rescue efforts. I know some of them. but. Let's zoom in a bit to understand why, especially now, the way this entire story is framed, even beyond the fact that it's in Congress to the actual story the title promises it to be, it makes it, oh, I didn't mean to do this, but um, well, here comes a pun, racist dog whistling. I have a real bone to pick with you, New Yorker. You're barking up the wrong tree with this one. Because even these stories having some basis in truth doesn't make them not an extremely biased stereotype that is indicative of the problems of international reporting on China and US-China relations in general. Reporters like to think that they are objective observers of the world, but what they choose to report on and how they choose to frame a story, well, it's crucial to examine to see what's being said between the lines. Now, having been a reporter here in China for quite a while in the past, I've been immersed in international reporting of China for at least a decade now. And I can't exactly remember which excellent journalist said this anymore. Feel free to credit in the comments if you know. But that someone brilliant once broke down most foreign reporting on China into the same three stories. China is big, China is weird, and China is scary. Now, ironically, by flattening China into all the same everywhere, and by focusing on such a small subject matter that truly doesn't have any superlatives behind it, Palm Garten has managed to make China for once seem very tiny. Hence a pandemic that originated in the central eastern city of Wuhan, a city larger than two Chicago's, can be conflated with a dog festival in a town that borders Vietnam. But he does lean into the weird and scary parts by highlighting things in a way that makes it seem like it's just not normal there. I could pick apart 
every single aspect of it in this entire half a feature, but that will take way too much time, so let's just focus on some samples. By most accounts, dogs in China are not cultivated strictly for food, though there are still dog meat restaurants in many cities. In Wuhan, dog meat soup is said to ward off disease. There is no law protecting the rights of domestic animals or prohibiting the sale of dog meat. Household dogs and cats tend to roam freely without having been fixed. See how unspecific these fun facts about this country are? The country doesn't have dog meat farms, but some people in it eat dogs. It's not technically illegal to sell dog meat. Those darn pets aren't being spayed and neutered. Those are all true. But they were also all true of the United States up until the 1970s. In fact, the United States still doesn't have a federal ban on dog eating, so there are several states where it is just as legal as it technically is here in China. A bill was introduced on the federal level about three years ago and has really done nothing but sit there ever since. But now, China is weird for not respecting animals in the way that the civilized people do. Oh, and by the way, that dog meat soup as medicine thing that uh, Palm Garden tried to use to tie this back to something to do with Wuhan, um, every Wuhan night I have talked to has been like, what the? I'm not gonna say that there is absolutely nobody in Wuhan who is eating dog meat soup as medicine, but it is definitely not a part of the local culture. And then there's this paragraph on Dog Rambo Jesus. Anticipating some danger on his impending trip to China, he had prepared a will and handed off the reins of NDLB to a retired healthcare lawyer on Long Island, Jacqueline Finnegan, who had been volunteering for Barry for a couple of years. I have no choice to go back, he said. Owing to COVID and political tension, it would be weeks before he'd be allowed into the country. Oh my God, this martyr. Thank goodness sake, Palm Garden. It's freaking hard right now for people with legitimate work visas to get into the country. And I won't go into the political tension part because I think on one hand it can be argued that yes, there is some between China and the US right now that may be affecting some people's visas, but actually the USA usually gets preferential treatment compared to countries like South Africa, which doesn't, don't, they don't have any beef with China, but China still will probably restrict visas from there more than they will from the US. The reason why China is being incredibly anal about letting anyone in is because they don't want to catch the Delta variant from all of you idiots who still don't believe in masks or vaccines. We can have another discussion about whether or not China is being too paranoid, but considering how Australia right now is going into full lockdown again and they don't have 10 million people crowded into a port city, I mean, uh, Maybe a couple of years from now, when the dust has settled, we can run the numbers and find out which way was actually the most economically smart. But basically, China's not risking anything until they can get their populace to herd immunity. And they are really working on it. You know, both my home building and my work building now have signposts posted outside that say how many percentage of people in there are vaccinated. I'm actually getting a vaccine today. But in any case, it has nothing to do with you and your dog mission, Dog Rambo Jesus. And if you die here in China, it will probably be because of your monster energy drink habit. Adding to that whole narrative, there's also this fun little anecdote. His first dog trip to China was in 2016. Barry told a winding tale. Some hundred rescued dogs sequestered in a monastery in Guangxi, where they began to perish in droves under the indifferent custody of the monks. Barry moved many of the dogs to a boarding facility on top of a mountain and arranged for the keeper to be paid. When the money was slow to arrive, he became, in his words, a hostage. He eventually escaped with two dogs fleeing what he called a posse of thugs armed with knives. Wow, China. Not only is the government scary, the people are too. This definitely happened exactly as he said. I mean, there's no room for any kind of misunderstanding to have happened at all just because this weird dude who speaks no Chinese went to a part of China that speaks almost no English. And never mind that it sounds like something slightly racist coming out of a third world country travel memoir when in 2016 Nanning looked like this. Nanning is the capital of Guangxi province. I mean, not that you can fact check a personal experience, but you know, if you can't have find any proof of it, maybe don't put it in the article, right? 
you agree with me, don't you? In any case, is this kind of an insidious framing or am I being oversensitive? I don't know, maybe I am. Maybe you just become a little sensitive when you're showing people something as cool and as magical as a place where you can hang out with huskies all day. And then for months afterwards, you are just constantly flagging comments like this. Especially since, in case you haven't figured it out yet, construing the Yulin Dog Meat Festival with China's relationship to dogs is in a sense like trying to describe an elephant from something you've seen of its butt war. Okay, let's start with the most glaring missing part of the story. Do you know who's going to the Yulin Meat Festival to rescue these dogs in droves? The Chinese people themselves. No, not foreign animal lovers, even though some of them do find their calling in uh, taking care of pets here in China. And no, not the government, though Palm Garden has mentioned that they have made dog meat laws so restrictive that the market is drying up anyways. But actual local born and bred in China animal lovers who find the festival abhorrent and backwards because dog meat eating was already on the way out in 2010 when the festival first got started. And they have been there more or less since the beginning, rescuing truckfuls of dogs way before Mr. Dog Rambo Jesus came onto the scene in 2016. And this is not new news. Here's an article from the Global News in 2014 about how the festival had actually moved its date earlier in hopes of foiling these activists that have been bothering it for years. I mean, I worked for an international advertising firm here in 2014 whose pro bono project was in fact to work with local activists who wanted some extra marketing to help end the Yulin Dog Meat Festival. It was a big enough movement even back then, two years before Dog Rambo Jesus's adventure in the monasteries, that we actually had a really big group strategizing on the most culturally sensitive objection that we can make to the Yulin Meat Festival because, you know, it's actually kind of xenophobic to go, ew, don't eat that animal that we don't eat in the West. I believe we settled on calling out the inhumane treatment of the dogs and the fact that they are very possibly dog napped. But you don't have to take my anecdotal work story word for it. Um, the Humane Society has published numerous articles about how the anti-dog meat movement is almost completely vocal. It's the white savior narrative for me, dog. So why are there so many locals willing to devote their time and energy to dogs? Because pet ownership has actually skyrocketed here. Did you know that the amount of dogs and cats as pets in China surpassed the amount of dogs and cats as pets in the USA in 2019? Last year, guess what the top selling product in China's equivalent to Black Friday Cyber Monday was? Cat food! Palm Garden cites that millennials in the US are obsessed with their little fur babies. And guess what? That's true of Chinese millennials as well. I recently actually did a talk about young China millennials and I ended up sharing this meme about what they think of their social circles throughout the years. And cities with the most middle class residents and therefore the most pets to deal with have in fact stepped up their services. So for instance, last year, Shanghai piloted the first free clinic for spaying and neutering dogs and cats. You can book an appointment through the app. Granted, Shanghai is not Yulin, but um, neither is Wuhan. Palm Garden does allude to the pet ownership craze in China with another paragraph that's another horrifying story of something that happened here. A recent outrage of the pandemic era and a new instance of West condemning East involves the so-called blind box craze, in which e-commerce customers in China have been receiving, as a surprise, gifts of puppies, kittens, or hamsters in the mail, many of them dead on arrival. Okay, so first off, the only reason this is pandemic era is because America is still in the middle of a pandemic. China, within the borders at least, is completely back to normal. These blind boxes are actually a new e-commerce gimmick akin to getting like gacha prizes in the mail. And China has been on an e-commerce gimmick kick since e-commerce surpassed brick and mortar retail like five or six years ago. 
Incidentally, China has one of the probably most advanced e-commerce markets in the world. I went into that in a previous video. So what happened was that some terrible people thought that sending live pets in the mail would be a good idea. It was pretty horrifying. Everyone was pretty horrified. By which I mean, second off, what the hell do you mean, West condemning East? There was no Western condemnation needed. In fact, I don't even know if the West heard about the story before Chinese netizens were already lambasting this as absolutely insane and terrible. Because again, everyone found it pretty horrifying. But you don't see those Chinese people in the story that's ostensibly about people and their pets. You get a dab of government policy, you have a Chinese-American professor trying to add some context, and by the way, he's the only Asian person quoted in the story. But missing is the biggest part of the puzzle of how to further animal rights in China. The people actually doing it. Instead, they're helpers or hinderers of dog Rambo Jesus. Or consumers of weird things like dog meat soup or blind boxes. Or crooked thugs demanding money to take care of these poor puppies. Now the bottom of the New Yorker article mentions this. That the title of this when it went to print was Pet Projects. In which case, I guess you can consider what Dog Rambo Jesus is doing in China as a pet project. I mean, it's certainly not leading to any systemic change in China, so... But then that would make this whole middle part, which is about what pets mean to us once we're done using them as comfort from pandemic loneliness. Also kind of a, what? What is this about? The narrative problem still exists. I mean, basically nothing really explains why the writer and the editor thought it was a good idea to smash two completely different 3,000 plus word pieces into one. One of which, again, is fine, and I would probably read a piece about it that is twice as long. And the other of which is racist trash that makes China seem strange and cruel while erasing all the Chinese people who are actually doing the work to make that one strange and cruel thing less so. All while conflating this strange and cruel thing with a global issue that has absolutely nothing to do with it. You might as well tie the Yulin Dog Meat Festival to climate change. And it's important to call out this narrative because it's one of the big problems with trying to inject any kind of sanity into talking about US-Sino relations. It's why when Wuhan went into lockdown last year, the international reporting was either one, about how Chinese people eat really weird shit, two, how Chinese people are so oppressed because they're being forced to quarantine now, or three, someone must be hiding numbers rather than, oh my gosh, coronaviruses are just incredibly complicated to source to begin with. And we think this one is pretty dangerous and pretty contagious, which is why we've taken the crazy decision to like economically cripple an entire region by locking down the eighth largest city in China. Just for context sake, the eighth largest city in the United States is San Diego. So imagine someone actually taking the decision to close off San Diego, only it's five times larger. It's not actually an easy decision to make, even if you are in a quote unquote totalitarian government. <sighs> It's why when China was developing several vaccines in tandem, the New York Times decided to run this one article that was like, ew, China uses hamster fetuses to test their vaccines when actually that is a normal part of vaccine testing anywhere in the world. And it's also why the administration I voted in in the United States has chosen this global corporate war approach to vaccine development where they are in an allyship with Japan and India against China rather than working with China as hard as everyone can to ensure cooperation across all global vaccine labs. And that's a problem now because India, which was supposed to be kind of the factory churning all of these allied vaccines out, uh, has been hit pretty damn hard with the Delta variant and now needs their billion vaccines or so for their own underserved populace. And that has ripple effects to places like Taiwan, which 
you know, being in, let's say, not the least tense relationship with China has to rely on the United States for everything. <laughs> They're not getting anything. I mean, that's just super upsetting on so many levels for me being born of Taiwanese Americans. It's why lab leak theory is now some sort of gotcha buzzword, uh, which is making China's scientists basically too scared to work with international people because like, no matter what reasonable explanation they have, it's gonna turn into some crazy conspiracy theory that they're out there to destroy the world by people who TLDR the memo. And this is the time where we need all of these labs to work together because coronavirus is not gonna be the only virus to hit us in our generation. Hell, it's probably not the only virus that's gonna hit us in the next five years. As long as there's eight billion people on the planet living next to hundreds of millions of animals that we wanna eat, I mean, zoonotic infections, they're gonna happen. I mean, look, Palm Garden's piece is just one piece of this. Obviously, a New Yorker feature that they still keep tweeting shamelessly, by the way, is not going to be the Franz Ferdinand of our next pandemic World War I. But this kind of thinking continually spread throughout the states can be. And I'd like to just make it stop already. If you found this useful, please like and subscribe. You can find me off of YouTube on my website and Instagram. Oh, and I am going to be starting a newsletter soon. Uh, I actually write a lot more than I film, so um, maybe you'd want to subscribe to that. A uh, link to it will be in the comments section. It might just become my new website. I really haven't updated my actual website for quite a while now. Sorry. Anyways, uh, see you next time doing whatever it is I happen to be doing.